let's start. Um, I know you're currently a state rep. You're an attorney, correct? Yes. 37 years old. Why do you want to be the mayor of the city? Yeah, because I love Chicago. Uh, I was born and raised here. My parents uh, both grew up here. My mother came here from Mississippi in the 1950s. My father was uh, was born here, not actually not far from where we sit today. Uh, and I'm raising a 13-month-old son here on, on the south side. Uh, and Chicago has always symbolized promise to me. It's always symbolized bigger and better and bolder and um, you know, intrepid uh, dreams and passion. And I'm a little bit nervous about where we are as a city. Uh, I think the trajectory uh, is problematic. I think the issues with crime, uh, the, the constant infighting within our education system, um, and all of the things that we see uh, from our economy to, to what's going on with our business community, uh, it's, it's damning, right? So we've got to find a way to move the city forward. Uh, and you know, I believe that not only do I have the experience to do it, but I've got the energy uh, and the plans and the vision uh, to help move the city forward. Um, you and other candidates say that you'll fill the 1600 CPD vacancies. Um, it's a priority, but recruitment is a real struggle right now, as I'm sure you are aware, yep. um, to get new officers to even want to be Chicago police officers. So how will you fill those vacancies. Do you have any specific recruitment plans or specific ideas on how to do that? There are a few things we've got to do, right? Um, I think the, the issues with CPD actually start with leadership. Um, so not only do I think we need a new mayor, I think we need a new superintendent. And I think uh, from there we can begin to uh, reconfigure the, the department in a way that works for the Chicago of today. Uh, one thing I've talked about is making sure that we are able to fill the detective ranks. Our detectives have a very heavy caseload and we have a very low clearance rate. We've got to find a way to make sure that once crimes do occur in, in the city that they're actually solved. We have like a 25% uh, clearance rate on homicides. That is dismal. It's abysmal. Uh, and the mayor has said that her goal is to get to 60%. But even if we did creep up to 60%, that still would mean that 40% of, of the murders in this town would go unsolved. Uh, that is not acceptable to me, right? And so I think we have to refill the detective ranks for, first to make sure that um, there are folks there to actually do that work. Well, let me ask you about yeah. that, though. But you, in order to do that, you need to take current officers and promote them to detectives. Uh, but that would be existing officers, and that would further create a dearth of officers on the street. So how do you fill that gap? Again, going back to my specific, how do you recruit new well, officers? Well, here's, here's the deal. Uh, all of those uh, vacancies don't have to be filled by officers, right? I've talked a lot about civilianizing certain functions within the department. Uh, there were some stories that came out recently about folks who have to register uh, every month with CPD because they're on a registry based on some past um, behavior from, from them. Uh, we have detectives registering these people. That's a job that a civilian can do, right? Uh, so when you look at the civilian to sworn officer ratio in CPD, it's like 14 uh, sworn officers to each one civilian. For instance, the NYPD is about five to one. LAPD is like three to one. So we're doing it wrong there. We're, we're, we're putting police in positions where they don't have to be, um, especially when we talk about having a shortage of officers in the city. And so what I've called for is civilianizing certain functions so we can put officers back on the street uh, and also uh, reconfiguring our maps, right? So currently uh, we are operating off of a CPD district map that is uh, 30 or 40 years old. Every 10 years we change our automatic maps we change our congressional maps, we change our state legislative maps because demographics and population changes and shifts. Uh, we have three uh, CPD districts that aren't even uh, existing anymore. We just skip over them in the, in the, in the numerical order. Um, we have to reconfigure based on the resources we have today so we can do what we can to strategically deal with the issue in the city. You, um, you jumped ahead to one of my other questions about um, redistricting, so how how do you do that? What is the criteria that you would use to create new police district boundaries? Listen, I think it's uh, very similar to the mapping process that uh, people undertake every year, once again, for political um, uh, and ward and district boundaries, right? You, you, you take a snapshot of where people are in Chicago. You take a snapshot, um, you know, talking with folks like the University of Chicago Crime Lab of where crimes are happening, um, where are current uh, district headquarters are uh, and you draw maps based on where you need to deploy people um, based on that strategy. You know, right now, once again, we're, we're, we're operating off of a 1960s, 1970s map. Chicago is not the same today as it was 40 years ago. 
Uh, and, and there are neighborhoods today that, that didn't exist 40 years ago. And there are neighborhoods that existed 40 years ago that aren't necessarily the same as they were today, right? And so um, I think you've got to take the data, take the analysis. For way, too, for way too long, the Chicago Police Department has operated without paying real attention to data and numbers and, and, and you know, uh, the analytics. We have those tools at our disposal. We have to be able to use them to better disperse and better, uh, uh, you know, realign uh, our, our, our officers uh, in the streets. How many civilian employees are you talking about bringing into the police department and how do you pay for them? Yes, I think they're, I think you, the numbers are already, already in the budget, right? Um, we've got 1,500 officers that were budgeted for this year that we're not paying for right now, right? So this is not new money, this is not adding money to the budget, uh, but this is once again finding um, functions and apparatus that we don't necessarily need cops in. I know this, this has happened in Chicago before. Jody Weiss actually began to pull officers from behind the desk and put them on the street. The problem is he didn't replace them with anybody. And so uh, the administrative function of the district uh, got slowed down. But you know, we, we, we have a way, I, I believe, uh, to see uh, what our, what our uh, possibilities are. And not just you know, uh, civilian folks who are doing the administrative work, but I talked a lot about mental health resources, right? Uh, a responder model where if someone is having uh, a mental health episode and they call 911, um, that they don't get a cop with a gun and a badge approaching their, their home, uh, they get someone who's trained specifically in this space to help them through their situation. There's a pilot program to that effect going on right now in a certain area or two in the city. I'm not sure if it's one or two areas. Um, so obviously you'd want to exp expand that. Um, also, money-wise, is there money to do that? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, one, that pilot program, uh, you know, I understand the way it's working and, and why people are doing it. I'm asking to go a step further uh, because in that program, it's a cop uh, coupled with a mental health professional. Uh, but if I'm having an episode and you show up in my house, I'm not going to see you with your clipboard. I'm going to see the guy with the gun and the badge, um, especially in communities that don't have the greatest relationship uh, with, with our, our department, right? And so we got to be aware of that. I've called for um, complete de-escalation and uh, sending somebody or a team of folks out to a home that aren't uh, weaponized, that aren't uh, officers, right? I, I, then I keep thinking about uh, December 26, 2015. This was the night uh, that Quintonio Legrier called CPD on himself uh, as he was having a schizophrenic episode. And what happened that night was that he ended up dead and so did his next door neighbor, Betty Jones. Um, we have to be able to avoid situations like that. As far as funding is concerned, there is money from the state government, there is money from the federal government. What we've seen is that the larger uh, gov government functions are looking for cities and municipalities who are going to be creative and do things different. And they want to give money uh, to these, these programs, and we've left that money on the table because we've refused to budge. Let's talk about um, the uh, Internet Intelligence Unit that you've proposed. How many people will work it? How do you pay for it? What would the function of it be specifically? I know I just asked you three questions, yeah. really four in one. Yeah. But how many people would work this in? Internet Intelligence Unit? Where do they come from? Listen, this is, this is another um, uh, budget kind of reconfiguration. I think we have the numbers in the current, current budget where we can swap folks out and, and make this make sense without increasing what we have, right? This is more on you the mean money-wise, money dollars-wise. Wise. Dollars wise. So this okay. is more on the civilianization of certain functions, right? This, this can be, this doesn't have to be an officer with a badge. It shouldn't be an officer with a badge uh, behind a computer watching trends and trying to help us figure out how to solve crimes. There are people, um, especially in this new age of technology, who can do that who aren't officers. Um, and so that's the, the first piece of it. Um, the reason that I've, 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 I've presented this to the people of Chicago is that we know that many of the crimes that are going on in our city everything from murder to carjacking uh, to organized retail theft. Um, they're being planned online. Uh, they're being perpetrated online. And after they happen, uh, people are going to uh, social media to talk about what they did and how they did it, right? And this is not, you know, some uh, 2001 George Bush wiretap stuff I'm talking about, right? This is people uh, putting stuff in the public domain that can help solve crimes and help close the gap in the clearance rate in Chicago. We've got to be serious about using the tools that we have to do that. How many people, though, do you think would man this unit? And you already said you think you have the dollars for it, but how many people do you see, civilian or officers, sounds like more civilian, working this unit? I mean, is it a 24-7 you know, team or, or what? Well, yeah, I, mean, I think you, you have to be able to look at it 24-7, but not you know, folks working around the clock. I think you have a, 
uh, a group of folks. I've talked to people in, in places uh, like Phoenix where they've done some work like this, and uh, in their department, I think they have about 20 people um, in that in that unit. Uh, and their city is, you know, the fifth biggest city in the country. I think so. You know, just two cities smaller than Chicago. Um, I think we have to be able to do a wholesale audit of, of where we are, what we can get going immediately. Um, and that's part of, our, of the job of the new superintendent. Whoever will come in and lead this department, I think has to uh, make these things make sense and fit them into a space where um, we get the results that we need. Well, you've just, I'll jump ahead to a question, and you, you've brought this up twice, new superintendent. Yeah. So you would replace Superintendent David Brown. What does your ideal replacement candidate look like? Someone from the inside, someone from the outside, what sort of experience? Yeah, so um, I have the great pleasure uh, in representing this very diverse state rep district. I've got five different police districts uh, that touch my state rep district. And so I work with a lot of uh, CPD folks, whether it's uh, the beat cops, whether it's the um, cap sergeants, the lieutenants, the, com the commanders, or the district chiefs. I know a lot of folks in this space, and we have some very, very good talent uh, in the pipeline who's ready to go on day one. So to answer the question directly, yes, I think it needs to be somebody that's from the department, who understands the department, both its history uh, and the present day where we are and where we need to go to move it forward, uh, and somebody who understands the city and Chicago's people. Um, you know, unfortunately, Superintendent Brown came in at a very tough time during COVID um, and had to learn the city very quickly, but it's become to me painfully clear that he um, is not ready to uh, lead this department into uh, the best version of itself. Listen, we can't keep doing the, the old things and expect new results. Uh, it's not going to happen. That's the definition of insanity, right. isn't it? It sure is. When you keep doing the same thing over and over and expect something to be different. Um, so you touched on this too, uh, but I want to talk about clinics. You talk about opening 20 more mental health clinics, but how do you do that considering staffing the current ones can be a, str a struggle? You know, I, uh, my understanding is the ones that currently exist, getting clinicians and whatnot to even staff those as needed is tough. So how do you do that? And again, it goes back to the money. Where does that money come from for 20 more mental health clinics? It's been tough uh, because the city hasn't really tried to do it. Uh, the 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 five clinics right now that are supposedly open, um, they're not all operating on on you know full tilt. Uh, the truth of the matter is that if I were a mental health clinician uh, and I had the chance to work at a um, a, a different entity that was actually helping people uh, and at a, at a CDPH entity that is kind of open, kind of not, where people have to come in to to book an appointment in 2023, you got to walk in fill out a piece of paperwork and come back the next day to get your appointment. Um, I wouldn't want to be in that space either because uh, mental health uh, clinician work is a calling, right? It's a passion you, and you got to really love it. And for folks to, to want to do it, it has to work for them. Uh, and so listen, I think uh, if we change the way we operate, if we uh, enter into uh, you know this, this century and not, not keep doing things the old way, we will have more, more folks that will step forward because they want to be a part of the, of the solution. Uh, but what I also will say is that this is once again a opportunity to pick up money that we've left on the table. Uh, in DC, the Department of Health and Human Services has talked about uh, funding programs in cities around the country who actually want to get at the issue that's going on with mental health. Listen, we had a mental health uh, issue before COVID and COVID has made things worse, but we have ignored it and pushed it to the side. And so when I talk about opening up 20 clinics, and it's, that, it's just not reopening the clinics that closed, it's looking at data and analytics and where the need is and putting those clinics where they need to be, making sure that four of those clinics are 24 hours a day, one on the north side, one on the south side, one on the west side, and one in or around the central business district downtown. Um, when, when I talk about mobile units and finding a way to work with the private partners, I think there's a way we can do it. This mayor has said we we can't do uh, public mental health services here and have private mental health services here. I think that that's a, a false choice. I think that's like making people choose between having bookstores and libraries. Mm, okay, interesting. Um, we talked about the redrawing police districts and and you know and taking a look at using different means to take a look at at uh, um, how that they will be drawn. Um, but who specifically would work on that? You know what I mean? Would that be a? Would that just be a superintendent and mayor no. call? I mean, would it have? Would it involve the new police civilian it folks? It would. It would. It would. It would, it would involve um, the soon-to-be-set 
uh, you know, uh, police civilian board, right? The folks who are running, three folks from each district. Um, I think you have to bring the community in. You can't do this from an ivory tower. You can't do this in a silo where the mayor or the city council or the police chief or police superintendent are the folks who are making this call by themselves. You have to be inclusive of the community. That's the only way that it's gonna, gonna work. And that's the only way that you can get some real buy-in from the people who is gonna affect the most. And do you do it once every five years, 10 years? I think 10 years is sufficient, yeah. Okay, uh, what about CTA? Um, I know we're talking a lot about public safety, but arguably it's the number one it concern one, of the voters one, right one, now. It is, two and three. Um, yeah. So, well, there you go. Um, CTA, uh, there's a lot of concerns about safety on the CTA right okay. now, in addition to other concerns. Ridership is down for reasons I think that are, in my opinion, very obvious, including the pandemic, you know, the result of the pandemic. But um, you've talked about adding video cameras. What about patrols? Well, I've talked about connecting video cameras, right? Oh. There are 30,000 cameras already on CTA, but they don't talk to each other. Um, there, there's, a, there's a discrepancy in the way the technology works something that we can fix, I think, uh, in short order if we put the time uh, behind it. As far as patrols are concerned, listen, I think that uh, cops should be where the people are. Uh, and so CTA bus rides, CTA train rides need to be a part of the beat integrity of districts within CPD. Uh, but I also... So part of the beat integrity, but not necessarily specifically assigned to the CTA? Well, so, the, so there we have transit, we have, the transit unit doesn't exist the way it used to, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are like 286 officers that are supposed to be assigned to um, said unit, right? Um, there should be people who are assigned to it, but unlike some people in this race, uh, I'm not saying that you, you flood the trains and the buses with cops. I don't think that's the right way to go. I also don't think what's happening right now with the $100 million contract for uh, private security and German Shepherds uh, is the right way to go either. I'm a, I'm a, a, a pretty regular CTA rider, uh, and what I see is that this has not made people feel safer. So I think there's two things you gotta do. You gotta I've talked about the connecting the cameras. I've talked about uh, bringing back CTA transit ambassadors. I've talked about uh, having a, a text program, right, where people can contemporaneously text when they see an issue. We've, we're always- Where do those texts go? to whatever this headquarters is, right, where people can be disseminated. Um, we always hear people talk about public transit. If you see something, say something. But the question then comes, say something to who, right? Uh, and so this would fix that. We, we've seen this work in places like New York City. Uh, but what I've also talked about is making sure that CTA gets their act together when it comes to reliability. Um, the fact that ridership is down, mainly because of the pandemic, but we have not done enough to push up ridership. It's made the trains and the buses um, fertile ground for people to break the law. Right? And so we have to do both of these things at the same time. They have to run on parallel tracks. Does it mean you also replace Dorval Carter? Listen, I think um, there is a lot uh, that he has done wrong in this space. Uh, and I've not been satisfied. Uh, I think uh, the fact that he has um, refused in many instances to come and talk to the city council about uh, what's going on with CTA, I think it's a slap in the face of the people of Chicago. And it's something that the mayor has obviously encouraged. And so um, I've not completely made my mind up on CTA as far as um, the leadership, but the CTA needs leadership, um, somebody who understands the system, somebody that understands how to use the system as a catalyst for the future. We can't, once again, keep going backwards. Uh, people move to places like Chicago because of world-class transit, but right now, uh, we're not living up to that, and so we gotta do better. I'm just checking at the time because I have one more question, but I don't wanna, oh yeah, we're running out of time. Uh, really quickly regarding connecting cameras, that's a major infrastructure overhaul, which would cost, I, I, it goes back to the dollars, right, and tax dollars, which would cost arguably millions of dollars to connect them. So where do you get that money, and then who really is overseeing all of that connectivity, yeah, ultimately? So the, there, are, there are studies from folks um, like the MPC and, and other people who have said that this is not actually um, a very costly endeavor. The, the technology is there, the hardware is there, it's just finding a way to code these things to make them work, right? Um, if we wanna be Silicon Prairie, if we wanna be the, the tech capital uh, of the Midwest, uh, we should be able to find folks who are doing the good work here who can help us make this happen. This is not, um, this is not rocket science. Uh, it just, it's just, there's a lack of desire and the lack of political will and a lack of leadership in this space. In fact, as a CTA writer, I, w I wish that more decision makers at the city council level, uh, the mayor included, and uh, folks at CTA actually uh, rolled the system and then they would be able to, to, to help uh, manage it in a better way. It's a terrible chef that won't eat his own cooking. 
Um, I like, uh, I haven't heard, <laughs> I haven't heard Silicon Prairie. That's a good one. Um, so you mentioned um, creating an employment slash internship network for students. Um, and by doing that, you would um, entice 38, the 38 uh, Fortune 500 companies to be part of this, of this network. I know the mayor has tried to do similar things. How do you do that? Like, what's your specific plan? Because they, that sounds great, but they may say, yeah, no, we've got our own system in place. Thanks so much. Well, listen, I think you've got to do it with them, right? You, you have to have the, the business community be a part of the solution and help build out what it looks like. Uh, this mayor has had a, a very contentious relationship with everybody in the city, but specifically with the business community. Uh, when folks like McDonald's say, hey, we want to be here, we want to make it work, but we got to fix X, Y, and Z, and the mayor responds with a middle finger to the CEO of McDonald's, uh, it means that uh, she's not taken serious the role that the business community can play in helping us move the city forward. Listen, I think you got to start from scratch push the reset button, let the business community know that we need them to be a part of the solution, especially when, they talk, when we talk about jobs for young people in this city. When we talk about the young folks who are unattached from school, unattached from uh, any kind of meaningful employment, and then we, you know, we, we sit back and scratch our head when we see the crime rate continue to rise here. Right? We've got to make the investments in a real way, and I don't think that the business community uh, is opposed to that. I think they want to be a part of, solution, of the solution. They want to just be brought in. But sometimes they want things in return, right? And one criticism is that a lot of large companies and corporations don't pay their, they get too many tax breaks. So. Would that be inevitably something that you would have to offer in order to entice them to be part of, of um, this network? And could the city afford that? I don't believe so. Um, listen, I've, I've fought corporate tax breaks, um, you know, tooth and nail in Springfield. Uh, and some of them make sense, uh, right? But very often they don't. And when they don't, I, I'm, I'm the first person to stand up and to push back on them. Uh, listen, living in a safe city, a city that has enough gainful employment in the city with a uh, education system that's on par with our uh, counterparts around the country, uh, to me, that should be enough, right? Uh, and when I talk to, to CEOs and C-suite people in this town, uh, they tell me the same thing. They, they want some civility, they want some stability, and they want this all to make sense. And I think as mayor, I can make that happen. Okay, again, checking my watch. Um, I have to ask you the elephant in the room question, okay? And I wanna make sure I get to it. And that is that you are, I think, very soon coming off probation for your DUI. So that, you know, could concern some voters. And my question to you with that would be, have you, if there was a substance abuse problem in your life, have you effectively managed it? Um, and do you feel uh, it would not interfere potentially with your ability to lead the third biggest city in the entire country? Yeah, well, let, let me be very clear about this. I've been not only honest and, and open about my past mistakes, but I've been accountable, right? I've done the actual work. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've talked to my God and my pastor and my family and my colleagues and my constituents uh, about all that has happened in the past uh, and asked them uh, to allow me to, to do the work to move forward. Uh, and I've done it in the years that have passed since uh, these uh, things occurred. Um, you know, I've become a father, I've become a husband. Uh, I've uh, been asked by the Black Caucus in Springfield to lead them through one of the most tumultuous times in our community's history. I've been asked by the Speaker of the House twice um, to be on his leadership team, and I've been, re uh, I've been elected uh, four times by the people of my district, right? Um, uh, the work that I've been able to do on things like assault weapons, and uh, increasing resources for our young people in schools. I think it speaks to the leadership, uh, and I'm, I'm happy uh, that I've been able to become a better person because of it. So absolutely, I think the, the, the track record is there. Uh, my, my results are very obvious, once again, in the, in the years that have passed since that, and I've offered that to the people of Chicago as well. Okay, so personally, you've, this is not something you believe voters need to worry about, and it's not something that is controlling your life in That's any right. way. That's right, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, you also talk about funding um, from 16.5 million to 33 million, uh, the city office of violence prevention. How do you do that without raising taxes? Well, that's a great question. Well, first of all, when people ask about, um, you know, how do we pay for violence prevention, uh, I always I like to remind people that um, the price will be high, but uh, the cost of doing nothing will be higher. 
697 murders in Chicago last year, right? 792 the year before. Um, the question should not be if we can afford to pay for it, it's, the, it's that we can't afford not to do it, right? And, and listen, so th there are a few things that we can do um, aside from, you know, without raising taxes. I talked a lot about going to Springfield um, to raise the local government distributive fund, right? That's the percentage of the state income tax that goes to um, cities from the state. It used to be a 10% uh, uh, revenue for the city of Chicago. Um, in 2011, the, the law changed and it uh, went down to six per, well, 5%. It's now crept back up to about 6%. One of the first things the mayor of Chicago should have done when she became the mayor of Chicago was de go down to Springfield and lobby for the remaining 4% that the state really owes cities. So uh, that's existing tax dollars? It is. It's just that it was decreased, the, it's, it's, the allocation. It's, 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 it's existing tax dollars that mm -hmm. goes to the state, that okay. the state gives to us. So right? it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean an income tax increase for it everybody in Illinois? It does not mean income, no, okay. it, it doesn't mean it at all. Okay. Um, it, it, it just um, reconfigures how much of that money the state gives to to cities and municipalities, which the city hasn't fought for. So, I mean, that's one way. And there's, there's a, a few other things I think that we can do um, to make sure that we have the resources uh, to keep our people safe, right? I think this has to be the most pressing thing, the most, uh, you know, the, the, the glaring uh, issue that we got to deal with. Um, and I also think, listen, we got we to do a real audit on what's going on with our budget. Um, I know that there has to be efficiencies that we're missing out on. I don't know how high they are, but uh, as a mayor, I'll have somebody come in a, and a, a third party um, come in immediately and look at where we need to uh, cut back on waste, fraud and abuse to make sure that the city is running uh, the best way it can, dealing with the issues that are most important to the people of Chicago. Now to a question that I have found just completely amusing in a good way. I mean, because okay. I'm, every time I'm surprised. What is one thing people don't know about you? Uh, I spent eight years um, as a ballet dancer. Uh, yes, my my, my parents, um, <laughs> growing up as a kid on the South Side, my, my parents both were very, very adamant that I was busy and that I didn't get caught up in the streets and I had things to do. And so um, it was everything from martial arts to music. Uh, but when I was about seven, six years old, my mother put me uh, in a dan dance conservatory uh, on 95th Street uh, and I did ballet, uh, tap and jazz uh, for about eight or nine years. That's, yeah. see, I love this question. Yeah. Really? I did. I'm a former dancer myself. Are you? Awesome. I am. That is so okay. cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I may no say. Doubt. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Completely, yeah. you know, lost my professionalism right there. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, and, and did you get a lot out of it? I did. I mean, I ended up, um, you know, being a football player and going to college for free because of it. But it, it did tremendous things for my footwork, especially as, as a larger individual. Um, I loved it. I loved it. Okay, that's yeah. a great, that's, yeah. I love this question. Yeah. Um, and then I think we're getting, and then I have a question when we're, when she, um, okay, I'm going to try to throw this in and then I'll have, uh, how do you balance the need for public, so we're going back to public safety. How do you balance the need, I mean, there's so many things to talk about, right, but we're almost up. The need for, how do you balance the need for public safety with police reform? Well, listen, so my, my plan, Safe for 77, talks very specifically about safety and justice, right? Um, I'm the only person in this race that has any background working with a, uh, a, a city and a police department with the, with the DOJ and a consent decree. I did it in the city of New Orleans. Um, and I understand that there are certain things that we have to do in order to change policing in Chicago, to change the culture um, of the department, uh, and to make sure that people feel safer and they have uh, some connectivity with the department. Uh, but I also talk about you know, putting the resources where it matters. When I talk about public safety, Dana, I'm not talking about CPD. I'm talking about CPS. I'm talking about housing. I'm talking about mental health, right? All the things that we talked about before now. Uh, and when we're able to, I think, uh, work in a, in a space of symbiosis for these things, the city will be better, the city will be safer, but it takes vision, it takes leadership and an ability to get along across lines. And you know, I think that this administration has proven that it's either unwilling or unable to do that. Um, but I think we can do we can do them both. I, I choose to believe that. We um, I'm going to see here, yeah, 44 seconds. Do you have any specific incentivization, if that's a word, programs or ideas to bring police officers, teachers, et cetera, back into the city? Any specific ideas? Some candidates do, others do not. Yeah, no. So I've, I've talked a lot about first. You know, as far as let me go teachers first. We we have a a shortage. Um, specifically with special ed teachers, right? Um, so my mother spent 33 years as a special ed teacher in, in CPS. Uh, so this is important to me. 
um, uh, finding ways to uh, to see what we can do to bring them in. Some some of these things that we've seen around the country have been about remuneration and resources and making sure they're paying more. Um, you know, we got to look at the budget and see what we're able to do, especially with the de decoupling of CPS from the city. Uh, but I think we need to look at that to see how we can operate in that space. As far as cops, uh, firefighters, first responders are concerned, um, you know, it, it shouldn't cost us a whole lot to help folks get a down payment on their home or, or help people move into neighborhoods that really need um, first responders that live there, right? Um, we've got a big city, we've got room to grow. When I talk about building a plan for Chicago, not just for today or for next year, but I talk about building a 100 year plan for how Chicago is gonna move forward, how we're gonna grow and welcome people here uh, and deal with the issues that are troubling us today. And will I be, finally, will I be safer if you're mayor? Absolutely, um, much safer. Uh, I think people don't feel safe right now. People haven't felt safe. Uh, people are less safe today than they were four years ago. Uh, but listen, people don't want to make these type of commitments because um, they're tough politically. But listen, that's the reason I'm running for mayor is so that in four years we can, we can have this conversation and you will say, I am safer. I feel safer. I am safer. And uh, people around the city can say the same thing. Okay.